This is Bible Academy. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we begin the Epistle to the Philippians. As always, before we start, we need to make sure that we have confessed our sins and that we're control of the Spirit. So let's make sure that we've taken the time to keep account of our sins by making sure we confess them and allow ourselves to be controlled by the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time that you've given us, allowing us to study your word. We ask that we'll have open and good hearts for your truth, that we might be attentive to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. The background of an epistle frequently can determine the interpretation of certain points within that epistle. So we take the time to look at some of the background of whatever book we're studying before we look at the actual words of the epistle, in this case, itself. Let's talk first about the city of Philippi. At this time, it was considered what they call a Roman colony, though it was in the area of what we would call Greece, more specifically Macedonia. Let me put on this map. It's right at the center top. I think you can see the flashing cursor there. Just inside the uh, shoreline there, about 10 miles from right here, the Aegean Sea. The city of Philippi became a Roman colony after a famous battle called the Battle of Philippi. That was between the Second Triumphant, which included Octavian, Antony, and Lepidus, and the Republicans of Rome, Brutus and Cassius. Octavian's side won. The city became, as I said, a Roman colony. That meant, even though it was not in the area of Italy, as we would call it today, the city still had the privileges and the rights of the Roman cities themselves, which included such things as a tax-free citizenry, autonomous government, had many of their rights that a Roman citizen would have. So the people within the city were treated as though they lived in Italy. So for a Roman citizen, it was a good place to live as opposed to not being a Roman citizen. If you look carefully at the map, there is a gray line here, if you can see it. Uh, right here it says the Ignatian Way, uh, via Ignatia. That was the primary road from Asia to the west. It went through Philippi. In fact, it went right by their forum. Now, the church in Philippi was founded on Paul's second missionary journey. That's indicated here by the solid red line. You can see it where it begins here in Jerusalem and then basically makes a long circle back around to Jerusalem. That story is in Acts 16. Now Paul comes to the city of Troas right here in what we would call the coastland of today's Turkey. That's where he had the vision of the man to say, come on over to Macedonia, which he did. The first city he preached in was Philippi. 
Now, Paul has a missionary team with him at this point in our letter. Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. Um, I should have said that the missionary team was with him when he went on this missionary journey. But the four men together formed the missionary team of Paul. Again, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. So when they first went in to Philippi, they found, apparently, not enough Jews to form a synagogue. But there were Jewish women there who would go to a place of prayer at the riverbank outside the city. We learn of the first convert, Lydia, who in turn opened up her home to the missionary party. After the missionary team left the city, it appears that Luke was left behind to help build up the church and would later join up with them again when the team made a pass near the city. Now the church of Philippi, as we will see in this letter, was involved in Paul's ministry in a way that uh, affects the writing of Paul. Not only did they support him with repeated gifts, but they actually advanced the gospel and continued to spread the word. We saw this in some degree with the uh, Galatians when we studied the book of Galatians. Paul visits Philippi again on his third missionary journey. That's in uh, Acts 20, 1 through 6. And perhaps stopping by on his way to Corinth and then later on his way to Jerusalem with a collection for the poor. Perhaps that was when Luke joined back up with them again. This visit to Jerusalem, however, resulted in Paul's arrest. That's in Acts 21 and following. That's when he transported, that's when they transported him to Rome and brought about the writing of this epistle. So what we're saying is, at this point, Paul is in Rome, in prison, but he is allowed to write and send off these epistles. Now this particular view that he wrote this letter from Rome is called the traditional view. I say that because there's a couple of other views where Paul was at the time of writing. The problem, as often is, is that we do not know for sure. Paul doesn't tell us for sure I am in Roman, I'm, I am in a Roman prison and uh, it's this year and such and such. He doesn't give us enough of the circumstances within the letter for us to nail it, to know for sure. But from the writing of the letter, it appears that he is in prison. We'll see that when we come to verses 13 to 14 of the first chapter. Now, as a Roman prisoner, uh, and having his Roman citizenship, and it was probably due to that, that he was allowed to have these kind of freedoms to write the epistles, to even have visitors, and even uh, conduct the missionary team's activity, from what we can tell. Now, there are two purposes that are clear in this letter. First is his thankfulness for the Philippians and their participation in his ministry. We'll see that at the beginning of the letter. The second thing we see in this letter, another principle that we should learn by the time we get through it, is the key to having joy in one's circumstances something that is needed by all of us, especially as times get more difficult. So we will see this important point of how to have joy even in the most difficult of circumstances. Well, as far as the author goes, few challenge the fact that Paul is the author, as it claims in verse 1. And then it goes on to describe his life seems to fit within the life of Paul. And then the thoughts he expresses throughout the epistle 
matches with his other epistles. All that evidence leads to the conclusion that Paul is clearly the author. Now let's talk about the dating of the letter. That is one of the issues that is not completely clear. I'll say that from the outset because to get dogmatic on something like this uh, is not the wisest position because we actually don't know for sure. As I said, we don't have that much evidence. But we go the way with which most of the evidence leans and has the best arguments. And I'm not going to go through all of those. You can see some of those in a good study Bible or even go deeper in a uh, respectable commentary. But let's talk about the traditional view first. The traditional view places the writing of the Philippians during the first Roman imprisonment, 59 to 61 AD. We learn of that in Acts 28:30. This imprisonment seems to fit the circumstances best and the activities around his writing as well as his work with his associates. There's a document called the Marcionite Prologue written around AD 170. Let me just put that document up for you. It may be pronounced Marcionite Prologue. I've never actually heard the word spoken, but uh, that would be my best guess if you want to do some deeper research. It states that Philippians was sent from Rome. So the first view is that it was written around 59 to 61. The other major view is that it was written at Ephesus, which it placed the writing some years later, or earlier, from 53 to 55, when Paul was in Ephesus for those three years that we read about in Acts 19. Uh, the viewpoint there on the issue of imprisonment would be that Paul was pointing to that experience rather than actually being there at the time. This view does have its problems but as I said neither view is absolutely conclusive. Let's talk about the tone of the letter. That's something that we pick up on early in the writing. This is of all the letters one of the most personal that we read of Paul. We read of his love for these people. There is a noticeable absence of rebukes or problems that threaten the church. Christ is often mentioned in the letter some 51 times in only 104 verses. The introduction is in the first 11 verses. And then comes the greeting, verses 1 and 2. Let's read the translation of verses 1 and 2. Now I'm going to do something different here I haven't done with all my teachings, but I'm going to explain some of the uh, ways in which I give you the translation. A word in brackets or words in brackets are there for an explanation. When you see something in italics like you do the word from here, that is often within other translations or it's there to aid us in a clear understanding. Often translators will add words uh, trying to make the translation make better sense. So one is clearly an interpretation and an explanation. The other one is to help the translation be smoother. 
Verse 1. An epistle from Paul and Timothy. Slaves of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi. Together with the overseers and deacons. As was the case when people wrote in those days, they say who it's from at the beginning of the letter. Verse 2, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the writer here of this letter is Paul. He's the sole author, even though Timothy is mentioned. The Philippians would have been familiar with Timothy. He was a known leader, especially at Philippi. Having been there as part of the team, Timothy had been there at the beginning, Acts 16, 1 through 12. And then later afterwards, Acts 19, 22 and 23 through 6. There's a noticeable absence here of Paul using the term apostle which he often did in his readings. This lowers the authoritative tone of the epistle. And instead he refers to Timothy and himself as the slaves of Christ Jesus. Now just because Paul doesn't include the term apostle, it doesn't mean the letter is any less authoritative. What it means is he doesn't need to hold his rank over these people for any kind of rebuke or anything that is really causing problems within the church that he has to address. But when he calls himself and Timothy slaves of Christ Jesus, this is an important term to understand. The actual term for slave, I'll just write the transliteration up there, is doulos. A transliteration is basically the English letters uh, equivalent to the Greek sounding letters. So we just write doulos, D-O-U-L-O-S. Now this word basically means a slave. We're not talking about someone who serves someone for living. We're talking about someone who is owned by someone. Very common in the ancient world. It includes the idea of being owned under the authority of a master. The slave was dependent upon that master. In this case of Jesus Christ. This is another way of saying that one has given himself over entirely to Christ. Now folks, that's something that all of us need to do. To fully submit to him, to put every circumstance within his hands, to put every care and every problem within his power, his sovereignty, recognizing that Jesus Christ as God provides all our needs, gives us our strength through the Spirit, guides us, gives us the Spirit to help us interpret the Word, empower us so we can live the Christian life. To say that I am a slave of Christ and mean everything that means, well, it becomes a very uh, loaded term with all these meanings. It's a way of saying that Paul depends upon Christ for his guidance, for all his supplies, his protection, his purpose, his direction. Paul writes to all the saints, the word for saints, hagios, frequent term, H-A-G-I-O-S. It means basically to be set apart to someone or set apart to something. Uh, we are 
Christians, we are holy in the sight of God, meaning that we are set apart to God. We belong to God. We're his people. The other key phrase that Paul writes here is, in Christ. That's a very important concept for the Christian. It's often used by Paul emphasizing the believer's union with Christ. That special relationship that's beyond just relationship, but an attachment. Uh, I would suggest if you're not familiar with that, look at the doctrine of the union with Christ. The doctrine of union with Christ, that's on the website. So Paul not only writes to all the saints, but he also mentions together with the overseers and deacons. These are the two designated offices in the church. The overseer is that person or persons designated as an elder, a leader of the congregation, a shepherd or pastor of the flock. These terms all uh, overlap, if not are synonymous at the same time. So that an overseer is also the shepherd, the elder, a leader of the congregation, a pastor. Those elders that teach may be called pastor teachers. But of course there are also there are also teachers who are not leaders, but leaders should be able to teach, if not being an official teacher. They should know the scripture well enough where they can relay the meaning to others. Now the overseer, as I said, was one of the clear designated offices of the local church. Paul writes Timothy later on in 1 Timothy chapter 3 giving some qualifications for the overseer. Let's look at those for a moment. This is a partial list. 1 Timothy 3.1 here is a trustworthy saying, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. These lists often are the pitfalls of many a man who wants to be a pastor. Notice the husband of but one wife. Uh, women are not to be pastors. Uh, this qualification alone eliminates women being overseers of a congregation. This is not to say they can't have an important position, uh, teach other women, teach children, serve in a major capacity, but it is not part of God's plan or his program for local church to have women pastors, that is, those in positions of authority over the entire church. This is not to say a woman can't be in charge of the children's department However, the church is organized. Notice some of these that seem obvious to us today, like not given to drunkenness, but you see when wine uh, as an alcoholic beverage was common in those days, often safer to drink than the water, one had to be careful about just how much he drank. Not a lover of money, an important part, especially today when there's so many temptations and so many things that seem legitimate uh, and the way people ask for money. Uh, one has to be careful about that, but that doesn't become his obsession, which is true of any believer, but especially of someone who wants to be an example and a leader over other believers. 
Now, since apostles, along with prophets, were phased out in the first century, this leaves only the overseer or the pastor, elder, in a leadership position. The term pastor teacher, which of course is the one that I use, is a common title used for a teaching elder or teaching overseer. Now the other office that Paul mentions here is that of deacon. In fact, this is one of those verses that support the fact that there are two offices in the local church. <clears throat> Now, the other office of deacon is not so much a position of leadership over the congregation as it is an administrative office. Uh, these men, and in this case I would not exclude women, they are basically those who serve the church in the distribution of things like funds or material goods or in charge of perhaps things regarding the assembly. If there is perhaps someone in a special need, they might organize a group of Christians to go out and visit or help protect. Uh, if someone is ill or in a hospital, a deacon may be in charge of administering that visit or that aid, whether it be financial or prayer or taking care of things for that person while they're away from their own uh, house or family. So a deacon is an important role, a recognized role as an office in the church. But its authority is limited to administrative things, as I've just mentioned. Paul also writes of their qualifications. In 1 Timothy 3, in verse 8, Deacons likewise are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as Deacons. Now, uh, the reason I mentioned the word men there was some emphasis is because in the qualification list, this, uh, this list uses the term men. But we do see women act as deaconesses in other passages in the early church. But since this office does not have authority over the church, I don't see a problem myself. That's the way I interpret it, that women could also be deacons, called deaconesses. In other words, they might serve more of the women's needs where a man couldn't really get in there himself and help. Same way with helping children. Women might be more effective, and of course these would involve people's gifts, their spiritual gifts, whether it be that of giving or helps or some sort of service gift. There's a variety of gifts and many ministries. So by addressing the Philippian believers this way, mentioning the overseers and the deacons, he's pointing out that they have something in this epistle to hear from him also. The common greeting Paul uses here, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I know all too often we read these greetings but don't give enough thought to the depth of meaning of the terms that Paul uses. Though this is a typical greeting from Paul, we see at the beginning of several of his letters, Romans, the Corinthians, and others. His wish and prayer is that they may receive God's constant grace, his favor, and his peace. 
both in their hearts and circumstances, and that is from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's talk about the word grace for a moment. So when we see the word grace, we see something deeper than just the word. The Greek term, charis, transliteration, C-H-A-R-I-S. It means favor or goodwill, to put it simply. But here's the key to understanding grace. It is non-meritorious. That means it can't be earned or deserved or worked for. It's something that God does for us. God grants grace unto whom he wishes. We want God's grace. In fact, we are alive because of God's grace. One could go so far to say that anything good in your life is because of God's grace, but at the same time, God often allows us to struggle in His grace so that we might grow spiritually. But when you think of the term grace, think of something that's undeserved. You can't earn God's grace. God is a good God. We are of the uh, sinful sorts ourselves, but God will often grant us grace, whether it be from the beginning for our salvation or in providing us the Spirit and the constant power to live the Christian life we have the indwelling Holy Spirit to utilize. Well, we should be utilizing it right now in our studying of God's Word so that we are convicted or convinced of what is true and then apply it in our lives. The Spirit comes in again and gives us the strength and the confidence that we need to do God's will. Grace is is one of the most important words in the Christian's vocabulary and in his life. And a close second is the word for peace. Irene. This word E I R E N E. You have long E's here. Irene. It means tranquility, harmony within oneself and among others. In part, it extends from the Hebrew word shalom, which is still a common greeting today among people who speak the Hebrew. It means prosperity, security, peace. So if someone comes up to you and says, Shalom, they're wishing you that you're doing well, that you're, uh, there's peace within your life, that you're prospering, that you're secure. Uh, that term alone is loaded with a lot of blessings. But when we see it in the New Testament, it extends to the fact that we have not only harmony with God, that we are uh, reconciled to God, but it's a wish that we have a tranquility, a tranquility within ourselves. Uh, this is the peace that only Christians can have. Sometimes in the most difficult of circumstances, during a time of suffering. Paul's desire and prayer is that they have this peace. Now, both grace and peace come from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's our Heavenly Father and our Lord who are involved in granting grace and peace to the believer. And whatever pleasant or unpleasant circumstances we are in. 
giving us the strength to handle those circumstances. It may be just to say the right words at the right time. Though often spoken without a deeper understanding of their meaning, these two words, grace and peace, are two of the most important words in a Christian's vocabulary. If you think about it, God regularly manages us with grace. Not based upon our good or bad behavior. He's not standing over us with a paddle ready to, ready to discipline us every time we get out of line. But he grants us many opportunities to get in line to do his will. Everything from the air we breathe, the food we eat, to opportunities to serve him at the highest level. To what we need to address every circumstance comes from God the Father and the Son. And this grace is undeserved and often unsought. And then we carry a peace within us that no unbeliever can experience or even fathom. Um, the unbeliever's solution is often to avoid thinking about God. But as Christians, we often have God in our thoughts. Are we pleasing Him? What is His will? And then as we pray on a regular basis, we speak of him in our hearts, or perhaps out loud. The fact that we are reconciled to the God of the universe, our creator, he is also our heavenly father. We are provided peace in times of trouble, knowing and understanding the sovereignty of God that he is in control and that we are under his care and watchful eye. There is nothing like the Christian who can have tumult all around him. And it may seem like everything is out of control. But God still has us under his watchful care, his eye, and that should give us peace. Now together, both the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ, gives us these two blessings of grace and peace. Something that we should pray for in the lives of others. Paul expresses his thankfulness in the next section, which is Paul's thankfulness, verses 3 through 8. I'll put the outline plus the verses on the board at the same time. B, Paul's thankfulness for them, chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. Verse 3, I thank my God at every memory of you always praying with joy in my every prayer for all of you because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, while being confident of this very thing, that he, God, who began a good work in you will be, bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. When Paul remembers the Philippians, he thanks God for the memories he has of them. They're good memories. When he thinks of these people, he thinks of the things that happened when he was there, things he knows about them. Nothing happened to spoil those memories or to cause Paul to avoid thinking about these people. It must have brought a smile to his face because when he prayed for them, it was always praying with joy. Notice that in verse 4. Always praying with joy. 
It was not a burden to pray for these people. He wanted to. It brought joy to his heart, knowing that the Philippian believers had done and were doing so many things right. He could thank God for all the memories he had of them, praying with a joy in his heart, knowing that they had learned how to live the Christian life, how to get along as a assembly. But the main reason that he always prays with his joy and he thanks God for the memory of them, he gives us in verse 5 when he says, Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. You see, the Philippian Christians caught on quick that partnering with others in ministry was essential, not only to the advance of the gospel, but to their own spiritual well-being. Let me put it this way. When you join in ministry, and we'll discuss some of the ways in which one can do that. We'll discuss the ways in which the Philippians did it with Paul. But when we join with someone in ministry, we partner with them, we become part of the team. Sometimes it's a support role, but those who lead the team, you might say, like Paul and Timothy, that support is essential to make them more effective to allow them time that they need to be better in ministry. And often that leads back to the kind of support they get. Now, I was in the military service many years ago. I was in the infantry. I chose that role. But without the support of the hundreds of people who were behind every infantryman, they couldn't be out there on the front lines. Whether it be those who supply the food, the bullets, the equipment, uh, whether it be those who were in the air wing supporting by uh, airplanes and helicopters and similar vehicles, or those on the ships, mainly the U.S. Navy. They were our support. And that's one reason a, a Marine could go out and be confident that he had the backup he needed in most every circumstance. And that's what made him effective, no, knowing that he would not run out. If he started to get overwhelmed by the enemy, he could call upon sufficient help. The point is that ministers need the support of others. Their prayers. Uh, often I have went to places and preached over the years and people would open their home for me to stay there. Uh, if I brought my family along, they'd open up a place for that. Um, that's very generous. But ministers, well, let me put it this way, they're human too. They need all the basics around them. And those who support ministers are contributing in a major way to that ministry. So keep that in mind, that when you support whatever way you do, you are parter, part of that ministry. Some people like to use the term partner. Um, I know that people use it in the ways of, well, if you give such and such amount, amount of money, you're a partner. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the idea that <clears throat> however you support a ministry, you are part of that ministry. 
a wise Christian should team up, you might say, with effective ministries. After all, what better investment of one's time and energy and prayers or spiritual gifts and even material goods than towards those who have effective ministries? I would count it a great privilege to help someone like Paul, to give him relief, to run letters for him, whatever he needed. And when I talk about effective ministries, I don't want us to be distracted by the, all the superficial things, uh, bringing in great amounts of money or nice buildings and so that the ministry can have this or that. That's superficial. Effective ministries are those that, first of all, do what God wants done in a ministry. That his word speaks about. Boldly speaking a clear gospel, teaching sound doctrine, ser serving in some capacity out of genuine love for God and his people. Or for people in general. Again, depending on one's ministry. There are a variety of ministries and gifts for believers to use. We see here in verse 6, says Paul sees their lives and hears of the works that their Christianity is active. Let's look at verse 6 again when he says, while being confident of this very thing, that he, referring to God, who began a good work in you, will bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Let's look at the term will complete. The future active indicative of epitello. E-P-I-T-E-L-E-O. It means to bring to an end, to accomplish, to complete. The future tense, of course, puts it in the future. That God will bring it to completion. The verse begins by saying that he's confident. Paul is confident that these motivated believers are on their way to maturity. That there is great reward at the end. Ended, indicated by the phrase, this very thing that God has began a good work and you will bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So Paul is confident that these believers will reach maturity. They show every indication of that. Paul is sure that what God started in them will come to its full completion. He sees the indicators of spiritual growth already in their seriously partnering up with him in his ministry. That's a great sign. It also keeps you in touch with them. And we see this comes in ways of direct financial support or in spreading what Paul is spreading, the truth. The truth of God's word. One of the ways in which you can see an effective ministry is what are the people doing? Again, it is God through the work of the Spirit within them who does this work. He is the one that began the work at the point of salvation at empowering them, controlling them to live the Christian life. And they then later on as they begin to grow and use their gifts in ministry.
Now, one of the things I think this verse is often perhaps misinterpreted, it's as if it's a promise. That's not what this is saying. When it says that God, I've used the word God, it actually says He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Uh, the completion is one to reach the maturity level that God would have one reach. Not all believers choose to go that path. Uh, many believers do not. They will not follow Jesus by obeying his word enough sometimes to not even get out of babyhood. They like being irresponsible Christians whether it be in sin or compromising so they can stay with some particular group of people, perhaps even their family. But one of the indicators of maturing Christians is what effect are they having around them. Uh, if one is truly living the Christian life, for example, in his own family, and he has a number of unbelievers, <coughs> perhaps in his immediate family or even in his wider family, perhaps his aunts and uncles and cousins and so on. Some of them may respond negatively to that new Christian in their life. But those often provide opportunities for discussion and perhaps leading others to Christ. But if one is silent about it within his own family, and there is a time to speak and a time not to speak, don't misunderstand, then one has to wonder, do they understand one of our primary reasons for still being on earth to give others the gospel? It is true, often family members don't want truth, and especially don't want to hear it from that person who they knew as a kid was so rowdy and angry and did that thing or that other thing that we don't talk about anymore. But when you are changed, which is what we're talking about here, and you're growing, and the Spirit is actively working within your life, that's going to be reflected in what you say and in what you do. It's true of all of us. As we respond in obedience, God grows us through the Spirit to spiritual maturity. Let me just give a simple pattern here. When we are first saved, we need to understand that we are babes in Christ. We're spiritual infants. We need milk. We need guidance. We need protection. That's often where it's important to come under uh, a serious ministry right away so you can grow. Some ministries just want to give out milk. Well, you're not going to grow just on milk. We need meat. We need the meat of the word. We need challenges. We need leadership. We need those overseeing us. We need to learn to serve. This is all part of growth. Then as we grow and we go through our adolescent stage and, you know, sort of like our teenage stage where we're awkward, we do the right thing sometimes and the wrong thing other times, we eventually grow, we should, to where we reach maturity. And as we reach maturity, by now we should be uh, using our spiritual gifts so that we get into some form of ministry. It may be any kind of service. Again, there are a variety of ministries. And there's many gifts. And then we get into mature ministry. Which is the goal of all of us. What's mature ministry? That's where you are at maximum production not only in quantity, 
but in quality. Where you are producing the best of things that can be produced with your gifts. Whether it be in service or in teaching or in giving or in ministering in multiple ways. And I don't even begin to list them all because I don't know them all. And the Bible often gives partial lists, but God gives each of us opportunities to serve. And as we grow, we begin to use our gifts in ministry and be most productive so that we are producing quality and quantity. These are the primary goals of every believer to grow to spiritual maturity on into ministry and then a mature ministry. Now you may say, well, I'm just a mother at home with my children. Let me put it this way. That is a very important ministry. You see, you mean just being home with my kids? No. But to teach them the word, to raise them right, to protect them from evil, to point out right from wrong. Yes, that's the true of every mother and father, but at the same time, as a Christian parent, you spend much of your time protecting, providing for, and training that heart to think right to do the right things to fill them with wisdom from early on now that I said is an important ministry but at the same time you have spiritual gifts that support the church it may reach outside the church uh, Again, I hesitate to even begin to list the opportunities here, but when you're controlled with the Spirit and you're growing spiritually, you will come to the point of ministry and whatever it may be. Mature ministry is when there's quality production. Again, not just numbers of people or money coming in or nice buildings and big parking lots. And it's certainly not popularity. If there's anything Paul and Timothy were not, and that is popular with the general public. And this spiritual growth continues, and our production continues, until our departure to be with the Lord, or his return, which is somewhat of another kind of departure, we might say, as our bodies are transferred or transformed rather into a eternal form and that time continues up as this verse says to that day of Christ that day of Christ begins with his return it culminates with the judgment seat of Christ when we shall all stand before him for both the good and the bad that's revealed, by that I mean, for reward or lack that of. If you're standing in line, and uh, you're at the very end of the line, and you find that when you get up there, there's not much reward, that's because you did not take the opportunities that God graciously gave you. Now you will be happy to get the reward you do, but at the same time, there may be huge amounts of rewards that you missed because you did not do the right thing or at the right time or in the right way. But let me make it clear. Sin is not an issue at that point. Sin has been taken care of. That was taken care of at the cross. But it's a lack of not taking the opportunities for good works and progressing as we should. 
Second Timothy, excuse me, Second Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, alive on earth, whether good or bad. Paul will mention this special day again in this letter in verse 10. In chapter 2, verse 16, he writes of it again in 1 Corinthians 1, 8, 5, 5, 2 Corinthians 1, 14. This special day begins with the Lord coming as a thief in the night, unexpected. But nevertheless, we know he is coming. It's sometimes called the day of the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. And what a great day that will be. When the Lord comes to get his own and then reward them for their faithful service. Let's pray. Well, Father, we do thank you for your word today. We thank you for the challenges that we've all received, we have received from this great epistle. We ask that your spirit might so enable us to apply these principles, to learn them well, so that we might better follow you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.